Hello. Yeah, all right then, fair enough. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about machine learning and how we got it into production at Zendesk. Uh, but before I do that, I need to justify why I can do that, and that involves uh, saying who I am. Oh dear. Uh, guys, that slide's not working. I'm Jeffrey Theobald, not a yellow circle. So that's right, okay. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you a bit of a joke while we wait for the technical problems to deal with themselves here. Uh, it's gone all weird. You can take that one there. So, who here is from Budapest? That's, that's good, yeah. Oh God, okay. Well, while I'm rebuilding this, uh, can you do that? Yep. While I'm awkwardly uh, covering for that, I'm Jeffrey Theobald. Pretend there is a picture of me up there with a quokka. It's a cute little animal. Uh, they're really sweet and they're fun to talk about. I'm gonna just keep talking about the quokka as, uh, as we make it all work. This is embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I've been working with Zendesk for about five years. I've worked in the data space for about nine years. Most of that is on Hadoop. Uh, which means I have worked in broken legacy systems in Java, I've worked with broken legacy systems in Python, I've worked with broken legacy systems in Ruby, and broken legacy systems in C++, and Java, because everything's in Java at the moment. Uh, I've also only occasionally deleted production data sets once or twice. It was, it was only a month worth of data, it was, it was fine. Uh, so, yes, and that's who I am. I'm really good at making up for time when things don't go my way. And uh, at any point, I'll be able to tell you all about the cool stuff we did at Zendesk. Uh, I really hope so anyway, because there is very little else I can say. It's, is everyone having fun here at the, uh, at the what's this? <laughs> crunch, yes, we're at Crunch, it's pretty good. There we go, we're getting there, and what, it's gone with the, it's still got the yellow dot. All right, here we go. I'm, I'm done, I'm just gonna go now. <laughs> All right, so that's me, that's the quokka, I was talking about that. There's one more thing you should know about me, which is that I love putting googly eyes on things and waiting for five minutes for my laptop to work. It's, it's really what I live for. Uh, so, to explain what we did, I have to kind of explain a little bit about what Zendesk is. Now, you've probably heard of Zendesk because it's pretty popular, but what we do is we deal with customer interactions. We help people work with it. Hang on a second. Uh, we work with uh, customers to help their customers do fun things. So for example, when you go and you talk to like your phone company, you email them and you say, hey, everything's awful, you've ruined everything, uh, and well, they email back and forth and back and forth until it gets solved, that's Zendesk, right? That's called a ticket. And a ticket is a full set of interactions where the customer does something and we interact and then that gets solved out. That's one of the main things that Zendesk offers. The other thing they offer is a thing called Help Center Articles. Uh, now, that's not actually an article, that is a magazine, but an article is a difficult thing to come up with a, a pictorial representation, so if you're a pedant, I'm sorry. Anyway, Help Center Articles are for those things uh, like changing my credit card number, how do I change my profile number, all those sort of things, questions that come up a lot that you can answer pretty much with a single information piece of information, so I'm sure you can probably already see it right. We could, we could combine these two things. What we could do is we could get it so that when someone submits a ticket, we immediately come back with some articles that might solve it for them. So that is what we gain, aimed to achieve. Now, you're probably wondering, what is this information like? How big is this data? How much is there? And the interesting thing is that it doesn't move very often. When you deal with articles, these things don't change very much at all, right? Because what you're doing is you're writing up a thing about a credit card or you're writing up a thing about a user profile. It's not gonna change that often because your product's not gonna change that often in these parts. So 
Bearing that in mind, I've written this little poem here. Feel free to say it alongside with me if you want. <clears throat> here we go. Articles cha barely change. Updating once a day should be good enough. Right? Man, you are a tough crowd. All right. So, as always, when you have a new problem, what you do is you take your existing system and you mutate it into something that kind of might work. And so that's what we did. So our system looks a bit like this. We have a new ticket that comes in. That's someone being angry at their phone company or possibly being nice, but probably just angry. Uh, we get it through a notification system. That then goes to our prediction service. And inside of this prediction service, we have a whole bunch of models. And these are built by our Hadoop infrastructure. Each one of these models is for a different account with us. Um, and they're all very, very varied. There are about 3,500 of these things on the existing thing we did, which is called CSAT prediction, which I don't really want to go into because somebody took up five minutes waiting for the thing to start. Right, so this is what we're dealing with. And you're probably wondering, how do we actually store these models? Because nobody talks about that. Well, the reason nobody talks about it is because we store them in pickles. This is not a reference to that cartoon. I will not speak its name. Uh, Pickles are the Python serialization object, right? Uh, they look a little bit like this when you're dealing with them. You can just take an entire Python object, all of its data, all of the functions, everything that you care about, and slam it into a file. This is really handy because you can then load that file. And if you know what the function is called inside of the object, you can just run it. So you've got yourself a handy little piece of machine learning in a box. So let's take a look at this metaphor and extend it to its breaking point. This is a pickle an actual pickle here. And at the top of the pickle, we have the brain. This is where the function call is stored. And if we follow the vertebrae spine by spine down here, we can see that the individual articles are stored within the pickle, uh, forming its respiratory system? Respiratory. Let's go with respiratory system. This is a fully formed uh, organism. But the thing is, it's not just one of them. Like I said, there are thousands of these things. There are 12 here. but. Thousands is kind of small to represent. And every single one of them is different. I like this slide quite a lot, actually, so I'm just going to sit here for No, I'm not going to do that. So the problem is, as you start to see with these things, there are some problems. You have to load a lot of information and analyze it in a way to build these pickles, which means you can't do a cold start. Cold start is when you get a new customer, they come in, you give them a machine learning model, and they're really happy. Uh, because we need months of data and we need tickets and comparisons and that sort of thing, you can't do this. You need to have data to begin with. The second thing is that it's really slow to update. We've already established that that's kind of OK, but it is a problem. But the worst thing of all is that it is really hard to debug because you have thousands of them and you have them in multiple servers and when something goes wrong, you've got to pull that object back, deserialize it, figure out what's going on. It's a pain. So we wanted to look around on that. We messed around with this model for a while and then our wonderful data scientists, our wonderful data scientists, they decided to go a different path. What they did is they wanted a single global model, which was fantastic, a great idea, except now we had to change all our infrastructure. So that's what we did. The infrastructure we use, as you've probably guessed, is TensorFlow. TensorFlow is an open source deep neural network by Google. Um, you can add to it, you can do all sorts of things. It's got lots of layers that let you work with it now. It's a lot easier than it used to be, but at the time we had to work with very little. Uh, it is properly serious stuff. Very quiet audience. Is that just Budapest or is that OK? Right, cool. So what does it do? Well, deep learning does a whole bunch of things. But in our particular case, what we do is we embed. And that concept is we take a, pet, a set of text, and we look at the text, and we go, cool. What does this look like as a series of numbers? So the intention here, and this is pretty complicated, so I'm going to repeat this a few times in different ways until you eventually get there. It tries to embed the semantic meaning of this text into a series of numbers, which is not super explanatory. So let's try again. Let's say that instead of in our 30-dimensional vector that we had there, we're in two-dimensional embed space now. Each of these dots represents a phrase, a concept, if you will, in two-dimensional space. So let's take the concept of using Hadoop, trusty old Hadoop. So if we look around that concept of using Hadoop, we will find things that are very, very similar to using Hadoop, very related. <laughs> and 
Yeah, fair enough, right? So the act of reading weird, obscure log files with thousands of lines of junk that you don't care about is going to be related to using Hadoop. But if we go all the way over here, we get to the concept of being cool, because despite what people will tell you, using Hadoop was never, never cool. Similarly, drawing googly eyes on things is probably not that cool. So, got it yet? Things that are close together, pretty related. Things that are far apart, totally unrelated. Google Hadoop was never cool. Got it? Cool. Let's go along. Let's pretend. Let's have a look at what we've got here. So we have our ticket. Why don't we look around that ticket at all the Help Center articles? So these two articles here, they're probably going to be very closely related to the ticket, right? Probably an answer. That's the theory that we wanted to go with. That's what we thought we could do. So we have this model that we spent ages working on. We then need to serve it some way. And the system to do that is called TensorFlow Serving, which is a good name. Uh, it is a GRP service, a GRPC service, sorry, uh, and it uses protobufs, which is really, really efficient, but nothing else in our entire ecosystem used protobufs, so we had to fuck around with that for ages. That was great. And at the time, it only supported a single model. Now, this already poses a problem, because when we want to work with this in production, we need to be able to shift between two, not just for A-B testing, but when we want to upgrade, we have to have one and then the other and kind of move across to them. We thought about a bunch of different ways of dealing with this, uh, including multiple servers with new models on it, and you just swap the routing that way. And in the end, we decided that we were going to actually just change the source code uh, and get involved with Google's open source stuff, which was awesome. Um, and it's really fun working in open source on things like this, because you get to go in a completely different ecosystem, one where you have 54 comments on a pull request, uh, including my personal favorite, that one there. Uh, I'm going to let you form your own judgments on that, uh, but I'm sure you can guess mine. Now, that leads to the first of my many interesting lessons and things that I've highlighted for you with the aid of cute dogs to help you understand what I'm trying to say here. And our first lesson for today is if you're going to use something that is bleeding edge, absolutely new, you're probably going to have to mess with the source and fix it up. Yeah, cool. So now we've got this system. Let's have a look at how it actually works from end to end. You've got your input ticket, which looks like a circle because all tickets look like circles. And it looks like this. Uh, the problem with this thing is that you've got to now deal with human beings. Human beings don't just write search terms in emails and hope that things work. They write greetings, and they write HTML tags, and they write a signature. Um, does anyone here have this particular signature or a variation of it, the, the printing before the environment thing? No, anyone? Don't be sh you've got it? Shame on you. We can never be friends. OK, so what we have to do is we have to take all this useless crap and we have to remove it, right? So we do a bunch of regexes. We remove things, not just the terrible HTML and pointless signature, and I'm looking, I, I will find you. <laughs> we have to remove everything that's not interesting here. Those numbers are going to mess everything up. So we regex it through and we come up with this, which is much more useful, right? We have some text there. It's kind of flowing. It still looks roughly like English, but it's really cramped down. From there, we then have to embed it. Now, I've skipped over a step here. When you embed this, you actually take these words, put them into a word to vec index, and then put that into TensorFlow. But nobody cares about that. You take this, and you turn it into a bunch of numbers. And then, and here's the clever bit, you get your articles that look like this, a whole bunch of other numbers. And because these are numbers, we can compare them, and we can see which ones are closest. We use cosine distance. Uh, there are other measures that can be useful here. But none of that is particularly important or interesting. Uh, and it doesn't involve googly eyes or cute dogs. So the next thing we have to do, as you've probably realized, because you're a very smart and attentive audience, <clears throat> you're a very smart and attentive audience. Closer. Hacks. All right. So you may have realized that even if you order all your articles as the nearest ones, some of them are just going to be so unrelated that it doesn't matter. So we have to threshold them. We have to decide which articles are interesting. So let's cut those bottom three off there. We have a complex mechanism for this. It is a real pain to solve, but it works. So once you've got that, you can then take the articles that you've got. And just a reminder, this was our original text once we cleaned it up. And we get, in this completely realistic and not hypothetical for demonstration thing, we get an article that looks like this, 
in an article that looks like this, these seem like good answers. So I'm kind of happy with this completely realistic and not fictional result. So just to remind you, we can do this because articles barely change. <clears throat> Updating once a day should be enough. So you're probably wondering how we stored these new embedded things. Well, we did them daily. We built every uh, EAP customer on a daily basis, which was pretty good. And we stored them, audience participation time, in Okay, that's four people. We had one before earlier, four now. Let's see if we can get to 15 by the end of the talk of people engaged and interested. Can you, can you do that? All right, cool. So we've got our pickles. Uh, and as I said before, pickles are a pain in the ass to work with when they're large, but we only had a couple of customers and we wanted to prototype, so we made it work. Now, we will eventually move on to databases. Uh, I particularly love this because I think of databases like a big, stupid dog. They really, really try. You give them a command and you hope it works, but most of the time you have to trick the query planner into doing what you actually want to do. Yeah, some laughter, good, all right. But for now, we're dealing with pickles because we're prototyping. So we've been building these things daily and we've sent it out to a bunch of customers and it's all going kind of well. And then we improved our model. And because we had embeds like this, we could just wholesale change the model. We didn't have to worry about all that weirdness of smooth updates and that because it was a beta thing. And we updated the model. It was really, really cool. So we put it in, and our deflection rate was about 5% at that point. The deflection rate was how many people actually clicked yes on this. We put a new model out, and it went up to 10%, and we're like, we are good. And it went up to 15%, and we're like, oh my god, we're going to win a prize. And then it went up to 20%, and we're like, oh god, something has gone very, very wrong. Because nobody is that good. Just, just not even me, I know I'm pretty good, but like not, not that good. So this is one of those weird things. This was what an email looked like when we sent it to our customers. We would say, hey, here's some topics. Does this one work for you? If so, close your ticket. Now, you work in software like me, right? The thing is, you have very weird names for words that don't really mean the same thing because you've got a very specific domain concept. Closing a ticket in Zendesk means that we archive it off and throw it in a bin and we never talk about it again. The word that we actually want is solve your ticket. And that's the word that it should be because that's technically the operation, solving the ticket. The problem is that normal human beings who don't work at Zendesk didn't really see things this way. What they saw was a button that said, hey, these articles are rubbish. I'd really like you to help solve my problem. So they pressed that and the ticket closed. So we very quickly put that patch in the UI back again, and we pretended it didn't happen, but it is pretty funny. <laughs> so anyway, the thing that I want, you know, this funky little dog here, and he is cute. I have no idea what the breed is. I'm not a dog person, but he's pretty cute. Um, you should really change everything piece by piece because it gets really confusing trying to figure out what's going on. Now, do you remember this poem? All right. Well, you're a good audience. I know you can do this. All together. <clears throat> Articles barely... <laughs> Bloody hell. All right, I'm gonna do it because I don't trust you anymore. You've broken my trust here. Articles barely change. Updating once a day should be enough. And at this point, we had like about 10 or 15 customers and they were using this thing for real and we started noticing an interesting pattern. What would happen is that they would try this out, they'd go, hey, this is pretty awesome. And they'd, they'd type away like little squirrels typing and they'd type up a new article and then you'd look at the article and they'd go, hey, I'm gonna send an email to myself and get the prediction for the article and they would do that and nothing would happen. Because even though this poem says, and everything that's in a poem is true, remember, that articles barely change, when they do, people notice. And once a day is just not nearly enough for this stuff. So the lesson that my new dog friend here wants to tell you is that we had this sort of dream of our system where things would move and they would move and eventually catch up. And we thought that was gonna be okay, but for customers, it was the first interaction with our product, the first time they actively did something with the product, and it was rubbish which wasn't very cool. Like, that combined with the other thing is enough to embarrass anyone off a stage, but I have no shame, so it's okay. So we needed to deal with continuous updates, so that's what we did, right? You can already see where this is going, right? I hope so, because you're a good audience? Yeah? 
Smart, or, yeah, good and smart. Paying attention. <laughs> right, so we've got our article here. By the way, this article is wrong, as we all know. David Beckham. Pfft. Chris Hemsworth is the sexiest man alive. None of this environmental email crap. Chris Hemsworth is the argument that I will die for. So we change that article to what it should be. And we get a new embed. So clearly what we have to do, every time the article changes, we get a new embed and we stick that in a database and sort of hope. So here's how that looks like. The article changes. That gets dumped into Kafka, everyone's favorite streaming system. We then pull that thing out of Kafka and go, hey, the article has changed. We put that into a job scheduler because we don't want this happening synchronously because otherwise someone will change a thousand articles and our system will break. And then we fire that at the prediction service, which goes to TensorFlow serving, gets the new embed, and puts it in... No! No, it's not... <laughs> it's our big dumb dog friend, the database. We have to do it this way. It was a good try with pickles. I had kind of tricked you up to this point, right? The problem is that now your stuff is moving two way. Before, we've been taking a big dump of stuff, slamming it in a pickle and throwing it on the system. But that's not what we have to do here. We have to continually change this. And now you start dealing with race conditions and write locks and all sorts of things. So we use our trusty dumb dog database, which I think I'm going to call from now on. So we've got a system where we have a model that continuously updates. People do that thing where they type like squirrels, and then they, uh, they update it. So what we needed to do is we need to change the model now, because data scientists haven't just been going, well, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> they actually worked on this model. So we needed a way where they could improve the model, change it, deploy a new one. So that's what we did. Now, and up until this point, I haven't really talked a lot about how embedding space works, and I'm not going to, because while it is exciting, I'm not. So you're just going to have to work with what you've got. Every time you do an embed space like this, you come up with a completely new space. Now, the relationships are all sort of going to be there, but they're going to be in different spots. So one set of embeddings up there might be in a completely different spot down here. This is a problem. It means that our embeds from one model even if we train it on the same data in the same way, will be completely useless on every other model. Not cool. So we take our database. <laughs> Who's a good database? <sighs> and we fill it with stuff, right? So we've got our proper article, which we have the embedded copy for. And every time that moves around, we update the embed with our real-time system. We've got a second article. We've probably got hundreds of these things. But you know, it's a slide, so I'll only put that. So, what do we do when we have to deal with multiple models? Well, we store multiple embeds. Yeah, smart audience. I could see you, you knew that. Maybe one day you'll, you'll chime in, but, but not today. So now you've got these multiple embeds, and you need to be able to route them, because we needed to do A-B testing. We needed to do slow rollout. We wanted to check this stuff and be responsible with our data. So that's what we did. We built a thing. Now. Inside of this layout, we have the prediction service, which is the front end for what we were doing. It basically was a JSON API. We have TensorFlow serving, which has not one, but two models in it. And then we kept a whole bunch of meta information in the database, which looks like this. We have details of the model. So we know that model one is the default one. We also have flags like everything has been embedded. It's safe to use this now, which is very minute detail, but still pretty useful to know about. And then we have the same for model two. So we start building all the model embeds. When that's finished, we flip the flag saying, hey, this is ready to go. And now we have the ability to do something really cool. We can route individual accounts to different models. And the way we do that is we just write in the table, hey, these two accounts here, account 20 and account 30, they're going to be using the new model. Everything else, by default, is using model one. But we did something really clever. Well, it's not, it's not that clever, but I'm going to pretend it's clever. What we did is we also realized that we wanted to be able to say, hey, use both. So if you have an entry for both routes in your account, then the prediction system will, get, will decide randomly which one of those two routes to use. And you've got yourself A-B testing. So it was just this little simple hack here. You've got A-B testing, continual rollout, and default upgrades. Because when you want to shift, to a new model. You send it to a few accounts first. You make sure it's kind of working right. And then you flip the switch. And that means you can delete all your account-specific routes. 
and all of a sudden, smooth, zero time things. Now, this was a really, really nice thing to have. Um, I've often wondered if we could have developed this particular experimentation framework earlier, but I'm not sure that we could. But my advice to you is this. The moment you have a chance to make something that you can experiment with, it should be the first thing that you do. Like, it just changed everything. Because our wonderful data scientists then decided to make a new model again. And this time, they were going to be unsubtle about it. What they did is they made a model that had a 1,000 layers. Now, that's a big model. The layer we had, one we had before, was 100 layers, which is still pretty good. And so they, they built this whole thing. They did a whole bunch of extra training. They, they would in the hours. They did that thing where they typed to computers, sort of like squirrels, but they're a bit more serious. And so we played it. We put the model out there, and we turned it on, and it was terrible. It was totally awful, because the thing was, it was 10 times more complicated, which made it 10 times more slow. And so we had this system just explode, because every time it tried to do something, it just slowed down. Nothing was prepared for this load. We'd essentially decimated, but the opposite. We'd made it 10 times more work for our systems, and everything went backwards, and we very quickly reverted that. Um, and that was the point at which we needed to start looking at optimizations. Now, we hadn't done any yet up to this point because we were prototyping. We were making sure that this thing worked and that our customers appreciated it, which I think is the most important thing. But this sad doggo here says otherwise. The thing that I would like you to take, if I want you to take anything away from this talk, aside from pickles, anything at all, then with machine learning, the way that models change is extreme compared to any other system you're going to deal with. A minor change in a model can have catastrophic effects for everything else because of the fact that you've got this unbounded complexity that can really blow out. Um, that's my advice to you. So the first thing we started doing when we were optimizing is we went, hey, this is how a system works. Now you can see there, right? When a ticket comes in, we do a prediction, we go to TensorFlow serving. When we have to embed a bunch of articles, we do the same thing and go to the same TensorFlow serving. This doesn't seem good because one of these embeds is really important and needs to be done now, and the other one not so much. So we did the obvious thing, right? We split the loads. We had two TensorFlow servings, one for the prediction path and one for the embedding path. So when someone turns on an account and they have 20,000 articles, it doesn't kill everything. Now, this seems like a really obvious thing, but I want to call it out because not a lot of people talk about this size of stuff. When you're dealing with a system with two very different profiles of work, they should probably be split like physically in some way between these two things. Yeah? C clever audience. Good, good work. So the other thing we looked at was how TensorFlow itself was operating. Now, up until now, you probably had a mental model that what you do is you go to TensorFlow and you say, hey, TensorFlow, got an article, got an article, got an article, got an article. And it embeds them one at a time, right? But it turns out there are better ways of doing this. One of the things you can do is you can take all of your articles, stick them in a big array, and pump it through in a single go. So when you're embedding your five or 10,000 articles, you probably don't want to do 5,000 at a time, but you can definitely do 10 or 100 at a time. And this massively reduced the overhead that we were taking on TensorFlow operations. The second thing you can do is not as obvious. So I'm going to do the thing where I explain it with text first, and then I'll do a diagram. So TensorFlow has the ability to automatically batch in time-based windows. So by that, it sort of waits a couple of seconds until it gets everything and then fires off and goes again. Let's, let's demonstrate it, right? So you go, hey, here's an article, and nothing happens. Another article, nothing happens, and so on and so forth. And when that window, which is usually about um, half a second, 500 milliseconds, when that window closes, it fires them all off and does it in one go. Again, it saves overhead, and it is called batching, which is the same thing as the other thing, which is kind of confusing. But those are two ways that you can optimize TensorFlow. And when we did this, we found our performance improved quite a lot. So we started looking at GPUs. Now, this graph takes a little bit of an explaining, because it's not immediately obvious what's going on here. So let's, let's break down the details. First off, we've got the response time on the side there. This is for batches of 10 articles being embedded over and over and over and over again. So we tried it with the bottom shows concurrency. So the figure one is just when we had just one set of 10 articles. We'd embed it, we'd embed it over and over again. 
And you can kind of see that the GPU is not really doing anything very valuable here. Uh, and they are quite expensive on AWS, so you really want to get your money's worth. When you go to three or five or even eight times of this batch, so you've got eight simultaneous batches of 10 articles being embedded, it doesn't really make much of a difference. But when you hit 10 and 15, the CPU just explodes and the GPU doesn't. And what we found, uh, and this is going to depend very heavily on your use case, is when you're under the right load and under the right circumstances, a GPU can do the work of about eight CPUs. It's pretty impressive, and it's always worth looking at. So our sad face, is this a pug, British Bulldog? I think it's a pug, right? No? Any dog lovers? No? You have to say it louder, man. Bulldog? It's a bulldog. Very important stuff. So this particularly sad-looking bulldog thinks that you should think about your systems and work out what performance actually matters. Until we had that big, slow model, we weren't sure how this was going to work. So about 15 months have gone on. We've had this global model out there, and we've done things. And at some point, at some horrible, horrible point, you have to launch it. You have to let people use your precious, special child. So I don't know about you. Uh, well, I do. You're a clever, clever, smart audience that is paying attention. Whenever I launch a product, I don't sleep super good. I get really worried about launching things because you know that the moment someone starts using it, they're going to do some weird thing that nobody would have ever thought of, and that's apparently normal now, and the whole world has changed, and everything's just ruined. Um, launching makes me uncomfortable. Even though we'd spent a whole bunch of time dealing with this, it was stressful. So we launched, and this is what happened. Now, you're a clever, smart audience, right? This is what happened when we launched. Now, that doesn't look like much of a gradient change, because what I've done is I've been honest with my axes. I've provided you real data. I could have stretched it all out, so it would have looked like we'd gone to the moon. But I believe in you. This is an impressive thing. We actually got people using this straight away, and it didn't break. It was so good that Chris Hemsworth would have been really proud of me. So we deflected 500,000 of these things, and we actually hit that 20% mark that we accidentally hit by closing all the tickets off on one of our accounts, which was pretty amazing. And because of the multi-model thing that we could do, we supported six separate languages, and we now have, well, the last I checked, it's probably a lot more now, we have 600 paying customers. This is, this is pretty cool. Um, and I think it's pretty cool anyway. Come to Budapest, they said. You'll have fun, they said. All right. But not only that, we had this foundational element that we could use. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's say we embed all of our articles back in two-dimensional space. You remember this from way back? All right, fine, whatever. You got your two-dimensional space, and you've got all your articles in it. What if you embedded all the tickets that had happened in three months over that period, or six months, or nine months? So what you're going to see is that sometimes, you know, like there'll be a spot where the tickets and the embeds match up really not, uh, the tickets and the articles match up, and that's really good. Sometimes there'll be tickets out in the middle of nowhere that nobody cares about because they're really weird. But sometimes, sometimes you're going to get a whole set of tickets in a space like in that upper right corner there. And what we're going to say to you is, hey, maybe, maybe get your little squirrel hands and uh, write up an article. Write up an article. So that's what we did. We made a product that actually found all these clusters of tickets that were unaddressed, and we provided them to our customers. Uh, fair word of warning, I didn't work on this product, so it's probably not that good. But no, <laughs> no it, it's really good. Honestly, the guys did an amazing job on this, even if they didn't want me. It's fine. Um, and that means that, like, again, Chris Hemsworth would be really proud of them. Because they had 41 customers. They summarized like 640,000 tickets and they produced 650 generational clusters. And the most interesting stat on this board, uh, the one that Chris Hemsworth would be really proud of, is that of the EAP customers, 40% took this information and they did something. They got their little squirrel fingers and typed up an article and they tried to do stuff with it. That's a level of engagement that I'm really, really proud of. So 
at the end of my interesting and enjoyable talk that you've all really enjoyed, I wanna point out that this stuff is great. It is super stressful and super tiring and it is harder than doing the actual machine learning part itself. No one ever talks about this, but I think we should. It's really, really hard to scale this stuff up because those models, they act in really weird ways. But it is so cool. It is very, very much the future of how this stuff is gonna work. Uh, so that's a callback to dogs in the future. Whatever, just, yeah, so that's the future. So if you do get a chance to do this, I promise it is worth it. It will be like going when no one has gone before. I was just letting you bathe in the applause a little bit. So, thank you very much, it was wonderful. I will join you up here. I can read the questions or you can take, take it away if you want. Would you like me to read them? You can, you can, have we got anything from Data Boy? He's been pretty prolific. Yeah, Data Boy did have a good one. I think he ran away maybe. We, we got, gave him too much attention, potentially. Mm. The first one from Tamash asks, how do you measure the performance of your word embedding model? What KPIs do you look at? Just to clarify, uh, there are two parts to this here. I assume you mean the, uh, the, the phrase and paragraph embedding model, because the word embedding is a different thing again. But that's what I talked about, so I'm gonna assume that that's the case here, right? Uh, what we did is we tested it ourselves. We had a bunch of stuff that we did. We made a gold data set by getting people to manually like try and see how the similarity stuff looked like. Uh, lots and lots of trial and error. So we had someone basically just going through a whole bunch of models and going, yeah, that's the right answer, no, it's not. So we had a real gold standard data set. And from there, we could automate that testing and make sure that the embeddings worked the way that we thought they did. All right. Is stand-up your primary job? You're so good at this. Anonymous. You know, from reading the room, I'm not sure I agree with you because you are the worst audience I've ever, no, um, <laughs> I have done a lot of performance work, um, but it doesn't pay as well as sitting in a room looking at a computer screen, so. Unfortunately, that's mm. the case. Uh, do you think articles could improve the servicing of HR, facilities, and other departments as well? That's a good question, uh, yes. Like, I found that people are really rubbish at documenting, not just software, but everyone. Like, VCR manuals used to be the joke when I was growing up that they were impenetrable, and they were. Now we've gone from that to having no manuals for anything, which I don't think is an improvement. Um, I think if you provide people a way of showing, hey, this is valuable to do this well and right, then it would be better for everyone. That's kind of what Stack Overflow does. It provides the manuals that are missing for the rest of the world. So I absolutely believe that writing detailed, limited, tightly written articles is the best way that you can provide help, or one of the best ways you can provide help. Absolutely. I totally agree. Love documentation. Could you quickly elaborate on the full network architecture besides your embedding layer, and how did you get the embedding weights? Ooh. <laughs> oh, I really wish you had not. that. Wanna no, no, it's fair, it's a fair question. Now, I am not a data scientist, I am a data engineer, uh, which means that I do all the work that data scientists don't wanna do. Uh, so, it is a deep learning neural net. It was trained on GPUs, it took about five days to train the thing. I don't know a huge amount of details about how it was actually done, I just know that they guessed the individual starting weights and they just kept pumping data into it until it stabilized at a point where the rate of Area under the curve rate of change was stable, so basically it wasn't gonna change anymore from that point. I hope that's enough for you because it's all I've got. Works for me. The next question, also from Anonymous. Okay, uh, koalas or puppies? Oh, that's a really easy one. So you guys probably think koalas are cute, right? They are monsters. Like, they make this horrible kind of pig screaming sound at night. And there's a video on YouTube, go and look it up, where a koala chases a girl on a four-wheel bike. They are just scary bastards, huge claws. Puppies, they're all right. So they win by default. All right, well, I agree, that, that counts. Anonymous, how do you map the words to numbers? Good question. Okay, so I did skip over this a little bit. 
with the word to index vec, basically we did a fast text extraction of about nine months of every bit of textual data we had in Zendesk. So all the tickets, all the articles, we wound them together into a 750 gig file, and we just rammed fast texted it, and that's how we got like basically a dictionary of words uh, to indexes. That includes misspellings, so if you get lots of tes, you know, T-E-H, and that sort of thing, it will have its own index, uh, but semantically it will be seen as similar to the in the actual deep learning model. So basically, <laughs> basically, we, uh, we made a map. All right. Ooh, big stupid dog. Oh, <laughs> someone was listening. All right, where are you... Th where are you thinking to enter the entertainment industry with a stand-up comedy? See, I usually only respond to questions that are spelled correctly. Yeah. But, but given that it shows audience engagement, I'm okay to take this one. I have actually considered doing, um, this is sounding awfully personal, uh, I have actually considered doing a magic show with a friend of mine who was very good at magic, where I would not be the one doing the magic, but I'd talk a lot. So I'd be the less talented of the two. Um, and as you probably know, uh, as a wonderful friend with the name that I remember. Tom. My name's Tom. Tom, right. I remember that. Uh, Dennis here, he was saying how I have like a meetup where we can find the best and most interesting people in the world and get them to speak about software, and I front that and make sure that that all happens. So yeah, over to you, Alfred. Sorry? Dennis. Oh. Yes, you. Dennis. Yep. Off Eric. to me. Come, yep. Okay. There's one more question oh. from Jolt. Which manufacturing industries did you experience suitable for machine learning? Which ones will come in the near future? Which manufacturing experience? Sorry, I'm, I know I'm relatively dumb, but I'm, which, which manufacturing industries did you experience suitable? Do you mean which industries? have a viable product for AI? Is that I what? That's I'm, my I'm not being a smart ass. I get it. You know, sometimes you don't say what you mean to say. Like this, this one time I told someone they were an idiot when I meant to call them a fucking idiot. So, uh, which was, oh, I got it. Uh, which, which companies did we have from which industries worked particularly well for this product, right? I'm going to go with that version of the question. Uh, we found that there were a couple of ones. The biggest ones were depressingly financial industries uh, because people just had questions that, like, no one answered. Uh, gaming industries were pretty rough. Generally, all the feedback was extremely negative, and they just wanted to yell at someone, so they didn't do super well. I'm sure you wouldn't have guessed that if you've ever played computer games or been on a gaming forum. So, Alex? We you want to do one last one? We have a minute. We could do, how do you measure the model's performance quality in your recommendation product? Uh, we go off the, f off the zero touch deflection. So that number I told you about, the 23% one, that was basically saying that of all the tickets that customer had, 22% of them were sold, and we believe correctly, uh, by this thing here. So the deflection rate was our main metric, and that directly translated to dollars because we could say it takes an agent about I think it was 14 minutes to solve out a ticket, and so we, we could basically put a money value on what this was doing. So that's how we did it. Absolutely, thank you very much. I think we're about out of time now, but you have any, if you have any more questions, find Jeffrey after the talk, and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them for you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>